you'll notice a, a slight change to the title uh, compared to what was advertised. So I had hoped today to provide some details of uh, what Mark could provide in terms of uh, diagnostic support and tertiary clinics. But unfortunately, things are a little bit uncertain currently. Uh, and with my clinical sessions being utilized elsewhere, uh, our uh, LBD, so Lewy Body Disease Clinic, is suspended and we haven't started our diagnostic support clinics yet. Uh, but as soon as I have some clarity, I will be able to distribute criteria and pathways to you all. So watch this space. Uh, I will, however, to speak more broadly about why I think these clinics are uh, particularly important uh, and will be in the future um, and hopefully generate some um, uh, issues to discuss uh, and generate some uh, questions a little, a little bit later on. Okay, so uh, Clive will be talking about uh, new treatments for Alzheimer's disease straight after me. Um, I do just want to mention one, which is aducanumab, which many of you may have heard of. Uh, it's an anti-amyloid um, agent, which is currently under review by the FDA in the USA as a new treatment for uh, prodromal Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I think uh, Clive will probably go into this, but I think it's highly unlikely it will be licensed. But it does just demonstrate that we are getting closer to um, having uh, an agent that will be able to um, potentially delay the onset or slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And it's likely um, because we're testing so many different agents that at some point in the next five or 10 years, um, we will have an agent that will either uh, slow the progression of or uh, delay the onset of dementia in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and even if those treatments delay the progression uh, to dementia by six months or a year or two years, on a population level, that will have a huge impact in terms of economic benefits um, and societal ben benefits um, to, to our population. But the question I have is, are we ready for those new treatments? And I would say categorically not. Um, and why is that? Um, I think we really need to think about the way that our memory services work, and particularly the interaction between our clinical uh, memory, memory services across uh, the region and research centres uh, at Bournemouth and at Portsmouth, but particularly at Mark, where we, we, we do a lot of dementia research. Um, and I think there are several issues, which I'll just touch on. Um, so patient selection is one. Brady mentioned this earlier. Um, our patients with MCI, um, at least in Southern Health, uh, tend to be um, discharged back to the care of their GP uh, without any other um, involvement. Um, I'm not sure if a similar picture um, occurs in other trusts, but it's likely that new treatments uh, for Alzheimer's disease will target the stage um, the, the prodromal stage, so um, amnestic MCI, before it turns into a dementia syndrome. Um, and we, we really need to think about what we do with these patients, um, because actually if we have new treatments available, um, it's likely to be us that will be coordinating delivery of those treatments. And if they're currently not under our services, then we really need to rethink um, what we're doing with those, those patients. Um, Another factor which is related is access to molecular biomarkers. So the latest NICE guidelines on dementia recommend use of uh, CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, and amyloid PET scans um, to um, differentiate uh, Alzheimer's disease from other subtypes of dementia if other biomarkers um, such as cognitive assessments or structural or functional MR, uh, scans uh, haven't been helpful. Um, so currently, uh, at least in Southern Health, we have no access, direct access to um, uh, CSF or amyloid PET. Uh, it's noteworthy that we do have access to that at Mark, but only in patients who are uh, enrolled in research trials. So we have people coming in to do lumbar punctures and we have uh, private contracts with, with companies that can provide amyloid PET scans. Um, but at the moment, that's only for research participants. We, we really need to think about our pathways in terms of how to get our patients across the region access to CSF and amyloid PET biomarkers. Uh, and I'm not in any way suggesting that we all have to dust off our lumbar puncture techniques. I certainly have no idea and cannot remember uh, the, the, the way to do that. Um, but we need to strengthen our links with um, uh, the uh, local general hospital. So for us in Southampton, that will be with UHS, University Hospital Southampton, and particularly the neurology and geriatrics teams there in order to develop a pathway. So that's something I'm working on in Southampton. I'm very happy to have 
conversations with anyone across the region about how um, how uh, you are all looking into this if you are um, and if you've got further than I have I'd love to hear from you uh, because it's proving to be a bit of a challenge um, and uh, I think it's important uh, just to focus on the access to molecular biomarkers because actually if we do have any treatments uh, for um, prodromal Alzheimer's disease it's likely that patients will need to be highly characterized i.e they will need to have evidence of having Alzheimer's disease uh, and having uh, amyloids in their brains through PET scanning and um, uh, changes in tau and amyloid in their CSF. So I think it's important that if there are treatments around the corner that we start to develop our pathways to access these biomarkers. Um, another point is that uh, future treatments uh, may be delivered delivered intravenously. So aducanumab is a, an IV therapy um, and uh, I think that just generates sheer panic <laughs> in a lot of us in terms of um, whether, you know, how that would work. Um, I'm involved in some discussions with Alzheimer's Research UK and the Royal College of Psychiatrists about where OPMH sits within that. So um, this might be a slightly controversial topic to bring up, and I'm happy to facilitate some discussion in the chat about this. Um, but should we be involved? Should OPMH be involved in um, treatment uh, for people with um, Alzheimer's disease and I'd, I'd say uh, yes um, I don't think we should be delivering the treatment but we should be involved certainly and I'd, I'd hate to see this um, left to our colleagues at acute hospitals to um, to treat people to treat our patients basically so I think we really need to think about what our role would be and I think it'll be a collaborative role as I said I don't think we're expecting us all to start um, giving intravenous uh, drips into our, uh, and developing them into our um, memory clinic pathways, but there needs to be um, some way of uh, delivering treatments when they are licensed, because I think it will be a, such a shame if we're not ready for that when it happens. Um, a couple of um, national um, guidelines have come out that have, that have suggested that treatments uh, perhaps should focus on um, uh, research centres initially. So um, we have obviously the ability at Mark to characterise our patients using biomarkers, and we do clinical trials delivering intravenous treatment. So it, it, it makes sense that patients uh, with amnestic MCI who are uh, potentially receiving disease modifying treatment should come to a place uh, centrally where uh, that is possible. And there may be similar units in other uh, regions of Wessex who would be able to get involved in that. Certainly Limington are involved as well, I know, um, and Bournemouth uh, and other areas as well. Um, and just lastly, um, Echoing uh, points raised by Brady and Claire, um, I put this um, article uh, reference of, of, of an interesting article up, uh, which you may want to, to read at, a, uh, at your leisure. Um, but I think one one key point about um, a consensus building about what we should do with our patients with mild cognitive impairment is, um, although there are different uh, clinical pathways for these patients, depending on what trust you work for, what team you work for, your own personal preference about what you do with these patients. It's clear, I think, that all patients with mild cognitive impairment should be offered access to research. So that's not just thinking about research as a clinician, uh, we should be offering access to research. And it's very easy to do that within um, the, the Wessex region. So uh, Brady mentioned a couple of ways to do that, uh, but you could simply just copy just ask your patient if they're interested in research and uh, just before you discharge them um, to the primary care to um, copy your clinic letter to mark uh, and we will do all the rest i say we but our, our excellent research nurses will will do all the the rest in terms of contacting patients um, discussing potential research studies taking people off of our uh, mailing list if they're no longer interested in research um, and uh, plugging them into the right research trials for them. So you might have noticed that we've got a range of type, a range of uh, research trials from just an MRI scan and a blood test to two weekly infusions uh, and everything in between. Um, so there's lots, to, uh, there's lots that we offer for patients, um, but I guess if I can leave you with one key message, it will be that um, all patients with MCI should be offered access to research, so please do uh, send them to us or your local uh, dementia research unit. So that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you for uh, listening, and I'll, I'll be around in the chat uh, if there are any discussion points that want that, that need covering from um, anything I've said. So thank you for listening. <laughs>